Does Xbox have third-party ambitions? We're going to talk the business side, the side for the gamers, and we're going to suss out what makes sense for everybody here next on Pushing Polygons. I think it's important that we start with some background here because there are a lot of turning gears at Microsoft and with them being such a large organization and Xbox being such a large organization. But now that you have all this power, what are you gonna do with it? I think it's important that we really dig into some of that minutia and get some background when determining the third party status and where Microsoft or Xbox is really going. In 2015, 16, when Phil Spencer literally saved the Xbox brand, what he essentially did is Xbox, as we know it, the piece of plastic, the box that comes out every five to seven years is essentially on life support. They could call it Microsoft Game Pass because it'll be on mobile, It'll be on PC and it'll be on a console and it'll be on a TV. However, why they stuck the Xbox name in front of Game Pass is the Xbox Series X and Series S as it stands currently is still the primary way for you to access their service. With the expansion of Game Pass and the what I will call the demotion of the Xbox brand. They could literally rename the division and call it Microsoft Gaming. I could see that happening at some point in the future. But Xbox as we know it, Xbox is a brand that is on life support. Now that's not to say that you're not still going to be able to get games from Microsoft, but the operating division as it is may at some point be called something else now why do i say this well you have all the acquisitions so they are a very big company and they're going to be putting out a lot of games but at some point microsoft xbox will need a new primary way to access game pass their games are going to be on GeForce now, but I don't believe, and I could be wrong, but I don't believe that is actually through a Game Pass subscription. You get the GeForce Now subscription and you get access to some of Microsoft's games. But the one thing that Microsoft has going for them right now is that they do have a partnership with Samsung and they do have Game Pass on Samsung televisions. Now, this is a portal where you can use your TV to connect to Xbox Game Pass or Game Pass as I'm probably going to refer to it from here on out and connect to it. So as Microsoft expands those options of access, the console becomes less and less important. Now for them, it is a matter of whether or not they are going to get money and and how do you get the subscribers there was some numbers thrown around and we're going to get now that you guys have some background we're going to get into a little bit of the business side of this there were some numbers thrown around that a call of duty game costs 300 million dollars a year okay so at 300 million dollars this doesn't include the marketing budget is my understanding this is just the development budget now, at $70 a pop, now if they were selling these digitally directly from Xbox, so meaning they get the full $70 to make a Call of Duty game back. Now, this is, again, just the development budget. They would have to sell 4.3 million copies of the game every single year. When you're looking at Game Pass, and let's just say Xbox Game Pass... You know, you're looking at $10 a month. And if you've got 20 million subscribers, well, you know, you've got 200 million right there. I mean, so that's one month. Now, what people don't think about is that when Microsoft has all this stuff, they have the electricity for the servers they run. But you're looking at about 30 million people in Game Pass to make up one game. And it takes them one month. However, they also have the overhead of the 
uh, server farms. They have the overhead of the electricity. They have the overhead of the cooling. Um, if they own the structures, I mean, yeah, there's some depreciation on the structures. Uh, however, you know, they have uh, property taxes to pay and uh, many, many other things which add to these budgets, which make it, you know, which is the reasons why people draw the question of whether or not Game Pass, unless you're a Microsoft type of company, is sustainable. It's, it's, it's those extra behind the scene overhead things. It's not whether or not, because 30 million people on a planet of a couple billion really isn't that big of a, a thing. I mean, New York City has what, 10 million uh, people? You know, 30 million in Game Pass really isn't that far of a stretch. But again, there are also corporate investors that you have to entice. You have to continue showing that you're growing, your units are growing money year over year over year over year. And this is part of the problem of being a public company. So when Microsoft is looking at this, so again, one game... 300 million doesn't include the marketing budget. You figure, I mean, if it's like the movie industry, you throw on half of that, uh, like, so another 150 million for marketing. You're looking at a single game, about 450 million. So you're looking at a month and a half worth of subs for one game. Now, if you've got 10 games, now Microsoft has what, 20, nine, 30, I don't know, 29 to 36 studios. So you get 36 games going. Now, of course, all those will be, you know, varying sizes of game and varying sizes of budget. But, you know, you got 39 studios. I mean, that's eating up most of your revenue every, you know, every year for so even say if you got four games coming out. So a month and a half times four, you're looking at what? One, three one, three, that's uh, six. So you're looking at half of your year of income going into literally the development of four games. At some point, you get to that equilibrium either through raising the price or subscri subscription count. Once you reach that saturation point of subscription count, you have two options. You either expand it, which Microsoft is doing. They've expanded it to PC, and now they're going to expand it to mobile and you know, games are going everywhere. Or you start putting your games out on other platforms. And if these other platforms don't have Game Pass, then Microsoft is still bringing in an additional, well, let's see, if it's a $70 game, you take 30% out for, um, you know, the retailer, whether it's Sony or Nintendo or Steam or whoever. So they're losing uh, $21 on that. So they are bringing home on a $70 game, they're bringing home 49 bucks. Even if it sells a couple million copies, that's probably at least worth the cost of porting it. I mean, they probably made more than that. Even if something were to sell, what, two, let's just say two million copies. You're looking at a hundred million dollars. If it costs them another 10 million to put that out on a PlayStation or Nintendo business-wise, that makes perfect sense. Now, whether it's sustainable or not, I mean, Microsoft in their other divisions, whether it's Windows, whether it's server, whether it's Office 365, all these other service-based products that the company uses, Xbox is trying to fit into that culture, that corporate culture. But again, they have shareholders that they have to appease. There's someone on the way, some thing. And when you have shareholders, you have to appease. Again, once you've reached saturation point, you have no choice but you to raise the cost of everything. This is what's going on with like Amazon Prime and other subscription services like that. On the gamer side of things, when you're looking at it, oh my gosh, people, and this is, and I don't care what industry you're in, whether it's Coke or Pepsi, Chevy or Ford, you know, PlayStation or Xbox or Nintendo and PlayStation back in the day or Nintendo and Sega, People are always going to have a preference of product. And the psychology of people is that they like their choices affirmed. 
you know, so if you're going to come out and say, well, this isn't good for this reason or this isn't good for that reason, or you're taking away their ability to say, hey, I've got something you don't got. It's taking away something that affirms somebody's ability to feel good. And because of that, you get a lot of this uh, tribalism. It's really crazy. So let, let's look at it from the gamer's point of view. And, and I don't think exclusives are bad. Exclusives are what give your service, whether it's Game Pass online or whether it's a physical console that you buy. It gives it value. Value, regardless of what you're paying for it, whether it's a $500 console or $11 a month, is why you buy something. If you don't think it's a good value, then you're not going to buy it. I mean, if you buy something, it's it's like people say, if you don't like something, why do you play it 150 hours? If you don't see value in something, why would you buy it unless you had to for one reason or another? Getting deeper into that, when you're looking at the exclusive, the exclusive provides perceived value to the customer. And speaking of perceived value, if you're enjoying this video, hit that thumbs up and leave me a comment down below of what games you perceive as the most valuable to Xbox or Game Pass. Now let's continue with the video. The exclusive is that extra piece which gives them the mental jump to actually go in and make the decision that, okay, I'm going to invest in this service because the company that is making the content that I like is investing in this service. So when you see products that were exclusive to your platform, going to something else, then you start questioning the value of that platform, especially if for one reason or another, they come to the opposite platform at a cheaper price. With Game Pass being in place, I don't think that's going to be the issue. The next thing to consider, and again, this is in perceived value. This is perceived, and I wanna make that point very clear. Perceived value is not the same as dollar value because there was an article that came out at the very end of last year where people were saying that, you know, Xbox put $9,000 worth of games in Game Pass. If you wouldn't play one of those games, and chances are, the odds are, it's very slim that you wouldn't play at least one of those games. But if the odds are you don't see value in any of those games, then it doesn't matter if it's $9,000 or not you're not gonna invest in the service. When we're looking at this perceived value piece of it, what we need to do is really take into account, are there enough individuals out there that are offended, not gonna to continue to invest in Game Pass because two smaller games are not any longer exclusive to the Xbox ecosystem? or the Game Pass ecosystem. Being that Hi-Fi Rush is smaller, and Hi-Fi Rush is a good game. I've played some of it. Um, I enjoy the gameplay. I didn't play through all of it, but uh, I, have, I have spent time with it. It is not, for me personally, again, we're talking about perceived value. So this is one of those things where perception uh, is reality. For me, it's not a cornerstone of Xbox. It's not a reason why I would buy an Xbox. Now, if you want to talk about a Halo, or you want to talk about Hellblade, or, or I guess at this point, um, Starfield. Now, these are franchises that have been bought by Xbox, that are owned by Xbox, that are cornerstones of the business. If they were to make a Banjo-Kazooie again, that would be a cornerstone of Xbox or another Conquer. These franchises that have been associated with Xbox for a very long time, you know, even Perfect Dark, there was a Perfect Dark on the 360. There was a remastered Perfect Dark, uh, the original Perfect Dark on the 360 arcade. I believe it's in Rare Replay. And these are the cornerstones of Xbox that I would truly be worried about. 
service games come and go. Sea of Thieves. I mean, you could love Sea of Thieves, find all kinds of value of Sea of Thieves. If you're playing through Xbox, it going to PlayStation or going to Nintendo is not going to hurt the value of your platform because it's not, although it is an important money maker for the platform, it may not be a game that is a cornerstone of the platform. And that is one thing that needs to be differentiated. What are your cornerstones versus, you know, what are, what are the, what are the foundations? You know, all these game companies year after year, and we saw this during the Don Matrick later years, where they chase the casual audience, they chase uh, some of the Nintendo Wii audience, and the core is left behind because they try to expand something out way too far. There's nothing wrong with expansion. There's nothing wrong with making extra money, but you do have to remember the crowd that got you to the dance. When Microsoft chased that crowd, they forgot who got them to the dance. They forgot the people who supported them and they weren't making the games anymore. When you look at Sea of Thieves, not so much Hi-Fi Rush because that would be more applicable to maybe the hardcore, but I could see a beat game, you know, it being a little more casual. It's not detrimental to the service and it is, there's more benefit to the company to put it on other consoles than there is detriment to the community for it to be on those other consoles. Now, again, if you were talking about Perfect Dark, you were talking about Halo, you were talking about, you know, 90, well, not even 90, but, you know, a dozen other uh, Forza, Forza Horizon. If you were to talk about those going to PlayStation or those going to Nintendo Switch, then yeah, at that point you've got a problem because that is the identity of Xbox. I mean, for years we said Halo Gears Forza, Halo Gears Forza, Halo Gears Forza. Well, if Gears showed up on PlayStation, that's a problem because now you don't have an identity as a brand. And that is like business 101 is the identity of your brand. So what this does is this brings us to his Xbox, a third party publisher. You want us to trust you, but the truth is you scare us. In a lot of senses, they already are. I mean, there's no question about whether they're a third party publisher. Everybody says, well, oh, they own windows guys. That's a different division. It's not the Xbox division. And it's sold through Steam. So technically, Xbox is putting it in Valve's marketplace. Um, so Valve's platform, because Valve is the biggest platform now. Valve uses Windows, true, but it's not a Microsoft-owned uh, shop. You know, they pay they get a cut or valve takes a cut just like a GameStop does the you know the the difference is it's it's their platform you know and microsoft it isn't as if microsoft hasn't done any of the work to make sure some of these games are aren't playable on linux I believe Minecraft is playable on Linux or on Steam Deck or, you know, which is, I believe, a version of Linux. So in that technical sense, Microsoft is a third party publisher. There's no question about it. The debate's over. They are. But when it comes to PlayStation and Switch, I mean, that's an extension of that. The only difference that Microsoft and Xbox and Phil Spencer and his team need to be careful of is whether or not the product that is going to Sony or the PlayStation or the Nintendo Switch is not central to the identity of Xbox or of Game Pass. Because once, once they violate that then that's where you really have the problems. Don't worry about the little games. The little games, you know, they figure they can sell enough to, to make extra money. I mean, you know, it's depending upon how much it costs to develop a game like that. It's, you know, it could just be easy money. Maybe they have seen 
interactivity, you know, drops. So they need to make some more money on it to get additional ROI because that's, again, a lot of business. ROI, if you're not aware, is a return on investment. But those are my thoughts about Xbox going third party. They're already third party. The The question of what, what games go to other platforms uh, is really... I mean, it's it's really basic mathematics because if you if you send it to another platform and you make it cheaper or give, you know, for me, just to, I guess, close out this story for me, if they were to do Hi-Fi Rush on either Switch or PlayStation and they were to put it in a physical format, then it's over. I'm going to buy that physical format because I see more value in that physical format than I do in Game Pass because I own the game. That means I can go back to it in 20 or 30 years. I've got a bunch of games right here behind me from any or in, and over here behind me from NES all the way up to the Xbox series and the PlayStation 5 and the Nintendo Switch. And then when the Switch 2 comes out, I'll be getting titles for that as well. So... Again, it, it all leads back into that perceived value. And I think that's really what we need to remember when it's coming to gaming. Enjoy your games. Demand games of quality. And if you like this video, go ahead, give me a thumbs up and leave me a comment down below. Do you think I'm right or wrong? Do you think that these games are central to the thing and uh, central to Xbox or Game Pass's identity. And do you think that they should should or shouldn't let them go to other platforms? Um, I want to hear what you guys think. This is a controversial topic and something that we are definitely going to find out a lot more about in the next few months and weeks down the road. So I want to thank you all for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Boop. And speaking of perceived value, if you're liking this video, give that hit a thumb. Five, four, three, two, one.